Well, you know, all throughout Scripture, Jesus honors women. And this is such a profound thought because in the ancient world, women had no rights. They didn't vote. They didn't work. They were considered uh, second-class citizens. They could not even give testimony in a, in a trial uh, without multiple witnesses. I mean, we're dealing with a, a very, very ancient culture. And yet, when you read the, the Gospels and when you study the ministry of Jesus, Jesus is constantly esteeming and teaching and training women. In fact, some of Jesus' most faithful disciples were women. Uh, Mary Magdalene being one of them. Uh, it was three women that came to the garden tomb to, uh, to prepare Jesus' body on the day of the resurrection. And uh, throughout the story of Jesus, we find Jesus ministering to women, teaching women, helping women. In Mark chapter 5, it's a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And Jesus uh, is walking through a crowd. And because women did not talk to men in public in the ancient world unless they were married, the lady got the audacity just to come up and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She thought, if I could just get that close to him, I would be healed. And Jesus turns around, instead of correcting her, he actually esteems her for her faith. Uh, in the same chapter, a man who's a ruler in the synagogue named Jairus has a daughter, a 12-year-old daughter that's dying, and he comes and pleads with Jesus to come heal his daughter. But on the way to do so, the servants of the man meet him halfway and say, it's too late, the daughter's already died. But Jesus goes and raises that little girl from the dead. And on and on and on and on and on, we see Jesus had such a profound impact and ministry to women. One of the women that Jesus taught his disciples from her example really is found in Mark chapter 5, uh, Mark chapter 12, excuse me, is a woman who is a widow. She's an elderly woman. She's a woman who is very destitute. We don't even know her name. We don't know her story. We don't know her circumstances. But the Bible gives us a little vignette of her experience in three or four verses found in Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And the Bible says, And he sat down opposite the treasury uh, there in the temple and watched the people putting money into the offering box. And many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny, which made a penny. And he called his disciples to him and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. Jesus says, disciples, come here. Listen, I want you to learn from this woman's example. Look at what she did. Now, in the temple courts, this is before we had iPad giving kiosk and edgechurchcolorado.com and the 90-day tide challenge and all that. People would bring their offerings into a chest, and it might have looked something like this. And the Bible says there was people that were bringing like really large gifts to Jesus. And Jesus is just watching. He's just checking it out, you know. He's just standing there. And there were people that were a little flamboyant, you know, in their giving. There were people that were coming in, and they were doing like <laughs> between the legs. There were people that were doing behind the back. And the reverberation of the coins was echoing throughout the temple. There were people that were doing their offering and they were doing the mile high salute. They were doing the Lambo leap. They were doing the high step. They were having a great time. There were other people that brought their offerings and <clears throat> perhaps they were a little different from the flamboyant crowd. They were a little nervous about their giving and they were just doing a little of this. But then there was somebody else. There was a widow. And this widow took two coins 
And she humbly brought those two coins and this was her sound. And Jesus was talking about that woman's gifts, not all of the people before her. It wasn't the amount, it, it was the heart, it was the faith, it, it was the passion that this woman had. And we're still talking about this lady 2,000 years later. A small little clang, two little coins. Many scholars believe this woman's offering was less than one cent. Just a tiny little wage. Uh, a widow didn't have anybody to take care of her. Destitute. In fact, Jesus said she gave all that she had. I mean, wow. What could we learn today from the example of this godly woman? Well, first of all, on this Mother's Day, we, we learn that generosity is something that is possible. Generosity is possible. In other words, everyone matters when it comes to generosity. It's not just the wealthy people that matter. It's not just the people that are the showboaters that matter. Everyone matters when it comes to generosity. Whether it's small or large gifts, everyone matters. Everyone matters. This woman matters. Sometimes we think, well, I'm not going to give because... There are people that are really wealthy that are going to bring those gifts. The, the rich people are going to take care of all that stuff. And what difference would my gift make after all, right? Uh, this widow could have said that, right? But, but, but it was the heart of faith and the heart of sacrifice that led her to bring that great contribution. Now, when we were um, first moved into our building, we were raising some funds for our facility and my kids said, Dad, we want to make a commitment to the building project. We want to give money to the Shake the City project. And they're like, Dad, can kids do that? And I was like, you know, yeah, kids can do it. So my kids made pledges. They get little statements from the church that show how much they've given towards their pledge. And we talk about it, and they got really excited. And they were like, Dad, we really want to do something significant. So I was like, okay. So um, we needed some new sconces in the edge lounge and so my kids got excited about buying those little lights on the wall and one of our other church members his two boys wanted to do the same so our four kids donated enough money to buy the little sconces there in the edge lounge and they wrote their names on the back and if you pulled them off the wall today I think it would still say this Bryn age uh, five and Zane age seven and, and they brought their, and it was a small gift, okay? It was a very small, but it was powerful. It was significant. And for them, it was very sacrificial. I mean, that's like no toys for a few weeks. You know what I'm saying? It's like a big deal. But it was beautiful in the sight of God. And, and I believe that this is the, the heart and passion behind this, this woman's gift. God measures our gifts not by amounts, but by sacrifice and by faith. That's how God wants us to give. We give by sacrifice and we give by faith, trusting that God is going to provide for our needs. Our confidence is Him. That, that, that's why generosity is possible. It's possible for every person, regardless of socioeconomic status. All of us can develop the heart of generosity. And many gave out of their abundance, but this widow gave out of her lack. She gave all that she had. And Jesus gave her so much respect and honor um, as a result of that. And if you look at verse 42, it just says, she gave two small copper coins, which makes a penny, you know. Uh, that's why Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, the widow who is really in need and left all alone, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. There's faith. I'm giving in faith. Everyone can give. Now, Forbes magazine came out with their top 10 billionaires in the world list. I don't know if you saw this a few months ago, but the top 10 list, the CEO of Amazon.com was on there for the first time, Jeff 
uh, Bezos, $45 million. The youngest on the list, age 31, he's worth $44.6 billion. Can you just imagine that? That is, that is cray cray. It's insane, isn't it? Um, to, but to be expected, Warren Buffett was on there at $60 billion. And Buffett says he's going to give away 99% of all that he has uh, before he dies or shortly after he dies. I'm thinking about sending him a Shake the City packet, actually. I think that'd be a great idea. Bill Gates, $75 million, topped the list. He's already given away $30 billion through his foundation. That's pretty amazing. $30 billion. But it wasn't the Gates and the Zuckerbergs and the Buffets that Jesus was commending. It was the nobody. It was the person that nobody even knew their name and who they were. And Jesus said, that person has given more than everybody else because she gave with the heart of faith and with the heart of sacrifice. You know, to, to, to participate in generosity, we have to be willing to adjust our lifestyle. We have to be willing to make sacrifices at times. We have to be willing to change uh, our habits at times. We were receiving a special offering a few years ago, and a guy came up to me and he said, Pastor, I'm going to give this money to the offering. And he told me the amount, and it was a pretty large amount. And I said, well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And he said, Pastor, I've been using drugs, and I've decided I'm going to give my drug money to God. I said, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard of. And by the way, it was a great offering. It was. I, I recommend that. Amen. Give your drug money to God. And he got blessed twice. He got blessed because he brought a great offering, but he got blessed because he quit using drugs. And he knew if he didn't have the money, if he'd already given it to God, he couldn't go buy more drugs. How about that? That's logical, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to give with a heart of faith and with a heart of sacrifice. And I believe that's the spirit of this, this ancient widow. Um, generosity is also personal, but it is not private. Now, our giving is, is a very personal thing, but did you know what? It's not private. And the reason it's not private is because Jesus is watching the offering. Look at this in verse 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Now, this would have been great reality TV, right? Because nobody even knew what was going on. I don't think that this widow said, Jesus is watching. Where's some coins? You know, like, what? You know, you got this, Jesus? You know, no, she was just responding out of that heart of generosity. And then, but Jesus is watching. Jesus, when, when nobody's looking, Jesus is watching. Jesus sees what we give. Jesus sees the offering. Jesus watches what's going on here. And the reason that's important is because the Bible says where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And for many people, the final frontier of submitting fully to Jesus Christ is in the area of finances. Man, if God can get your treasure, then God will have your heart and your life. Okay? That's really true. And, I, and this woman got that. So the offering is personal, but it's not private because Jesus is watching the offering. Now, I love to study over at Starbucks. And I spend probably, you know, four or five mornings over there at Starbucks. All the baristas in town know me, okay? It's awesome. I got friends. I walk in, they start making the drinks. You know, they just got it all together. And one of the managers said, Ryan, you keep the lights on over here. And I was like, thank you very much. Well, I was in a real deep spiritual moment. I had my headphones on. I was like studying for a sermon and I saw something really weird out of the corner of my eye one morning at Starbucks. And um, I saw one of the baristas, he was arranging the sugar cookies and he was like, you know, putting them in order, you know, the, the big glass counter. And then he did something completely unexpected. He, gra he pinched a little piece of cookie off and he ate it really quick. And, you know, if he would have, like, taken a cookie and gone outside, and I was, oh, he's taking a smoke break or something like that, I would have totally understood. But it was so incognito, it was, like, really awesome to watch. So I'm watching this guy, and he doesn't know I'm watching him. And he's breaking a piece off, and then he's, like, you know, doing some more stuff. And then he 
gets another bite of the cookie and he turns like this and and he's working more and the entire morning he was eating the cookies and I thought man that's amazing so I went up and gave him a hard time about it I was like hey how are the cookies this morning you know and he turned kind of red and kind of was looking around like hoping nobody I thought it was funny well the regional manager for Starbucks because I know her too because I'm there all the time and she walks in and, you know, she's got like her notebooks and, the, you know, their, 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 her computer and she's doing an evaluation. She's probably wondering where all the cookies went, you know. And she walks in and I thought, you know, how amazing would that be? And I, and I wonder if the barista would be eating the cookies if he knew that the regional manager was watching, Right. Because a lot of times we change our behavior based on who's watching, don't we? If we're working on a project at work and our boss is watching, we kind of up our game, don't we? <laughs> if our wife is watching, we up our game a little bit. If our kids are watching, we do things a little differently. When we're by ourselves, well, the Lord only knows, right? We eat cookies. That's what we do. How would we bring tithes and offerings to God if we did so recognizing and realizing that Jesus is watching the offering? Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching when we're eating those cookies. He, he sees everything that we do. He sees it all. And Jesus is still watching. Uh, this woman brought her offering with, with great passion. With a great passion. And, and God wants us to be people that are passionate in our giving, you know, are passionate in our generosity. Um, we talked last week about our tithes and, you know, the tithe is the first 10% that belongs to God. And I'm so thankful that God has put in the Bible a standard for us to evaluate our faithfulness by because if, if God had not given us the tithe, we would just have a hundred million definitions of what generosity and giving should look like. So we have a standard that's set before us, 10%. But the Bible talks even more about generosity giving. It talks about the heart. And if you only think about stewardship from the perspective of the objective standard, 10% to God, and you miss the fact that God wants us to give with passion and with heart, then we'll get all this mixed up. And I know people, I know people that bring 10 to God, but they forget about the joy and they forget about the heart too, right? Because we can just become almost religious and under obligation in bringing those ties. Let me remind us this. God wants us to be cheerful givers, the Bible says. Uh, God wants us to be enthusiastic about bringing gifts to God. And this woman had to be passionate. I mean, if you only got two little coins and you're a widow and you got no income and no husband to take care of you and you bring it all to God, there has to be something in you that makes you passionate, doesn't it? To be something in you that, 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 that moves you, that, that compels you to do so. Um, we've been in a season where we've been talking about uh, our Shake the City project. And uh, many of you have been contributing to that. And you've been doing so because you're passionate about the house of God. And if you haven't had an opportunity to turn in one of those pledge cards, there's one in the chair in front of you. We'd love to have you on the team. I hope you do so because you are passionate about what God is doing. I hope you're passionate about it. I hope you believe in it. I hope there's something in your heart that just stirs when we think about um, reaching our financial ca capacity here as a local church. Um, it, Jesus says, disciples in verse 43 and 44, look at this woman and do that. Look at this example that I'm esteeming and guys do what she did. I think those same words echo in our in our mindsets today. He puts her on that pedestal. And not only did Jesus know about this woman's circumstances, he knew her heart. And you have to ask the question, well, how did Jesus know that she was a widow and that that was all she had and all that? Because he's Jesus. And Jesus knows everything. 
Listen, Jesus knows your circumstance. He knows your hurts. He knows your pains. He knows your disappointments. He knows where you're struggling. He knows when you're joyful. He knows it all. He knows there's no hiding from him. There's no hiding. There's no hiding. Uh, we love to give here at Edge Church because lives are being changed. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine a couple of years ago that had come to the church and committed his life to Christ. And he said, Pastor, I was on the verge of committing suicide when I came to Edge Church. And I found Christ. And I chose to not take my life because of what God was doing in my life here at the church. Is that amazing? Does that remind us of why we do what we do? People are hurting, people are struggling, and, and people need God's work and the church and all that. Those things matter. When we bring tithes and offerings to God, we propel ministry forward to happen, don't we? I, I love to give also because it influences the next generation. Is there anything better than seeing kids love and worship Jesus? I mean, that is the best thing. I am so pumped about Wild Week coming up this, this summer. Um, just to see so many kids commit their lives to Christ and worship. It's just amazing. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. And we asked some of our kids why they loved coming to church so much. Because we've really tried to create an environment where kids love to come to church, right? As a parent, is that a blessing when your kids are like, I get to go to church today, right? Not, Mom, please don't take me to church. Here's what some kids said. Ramsey Thayer said this, I love my church because that's where I asked Jesus into my heart. Is that cool? Uh, Deanna Bell is a kindergartner. She says she likes to come to church because she likes to dance. <laughs> we got some dancing going on back here in our kids' ministry. Some moves. Uh, Diavani said this, I love to color and have fun. I love those crafts. Learning Bible stories about Jesus, you know. Uh, Adele and Jovi, two sisters. We like to talk about Jesus at church because we can't do it at school. Isn't that great? We love to come to church because we get to talk about Jesus. We'll learn about Jesus. Aiden is one of our middle school boys. He says, I love coming to church because I love teaching the little kids to worship. He's one of our worship leaders in the kids' ministry. Isn't that great? The big kids are helping the little kids. Big kids are helping the little kids. And Darion, he has the best thing to say. He says, I come to church to see my favorite pastor. A <laughs> uh, man, man after God's own heart right there. <laughs> That's awesome. We give accordingly, man. We give because we love to see that happen. There's kind of a myth out there that says it's unpleasant to give, you know. Let me ask you a question. When you buy somebody a present and a gift, do you say, hey, why don't you just open this sometime later and uh, I got some other things to do, you know, peace out. No, when you buy somebody a gift, you're like, I want you to open it. You know, we got Gina some Mother's Day gifts we're about to open here in a little bit. And we bought some nice gifts too. I'm excited about this. I want to watch her open the gift because she's going to like the gift. It's going to bring her joy and it feels good when I give somebody something and they enjoy it, right? I'm blessed. That's fun. That would be weird if I said, honey, why don't you go open your Mother's Day packages up in the closet? <laughs> you know, I'm going to watch some TV for a minute. You know, that'd be a little odd. Giving is fun. Blessing others is joyful. It's great to see people enjoy what we give, right? Yeah, so it's not unpleasant to give. It's pleasant to give. It is. Another myth is this, I won't have enough. If I give, I won't have enough. I think this perhaps might be the biggest worry that we have. Let me remind us today. Jesus took a few loaves and a few fishes and he fed more than 5,000 people. Wow. Nobody can do more with a little than God. All right? So see, when you put your finances under the authority of God, remember this. God is able to do great things. 
He's able to do great things. He's able to do really great things. Our generosity is personal, but it's not private. Generosity is for everyone, regardless of whether we have a lot or a little. Generosity is passionate because it comes from the heart and from the soul and from the position of faith and trust in God. Would you pray with me?